Welcome to the Free Cities Podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to the Free Cities Podcast, episode number 24. I hope you've had an inspiring and productive week. I've just returned from our Free Cities Foundation trip to Portugal and Montenegro, and I can happily report back that we've managed to clock up over 20 new and fascinating interviews for this podcast. We've been discussing everything from what it was like to live in a medieval city-state to what it might be like to create a free city on an asteroid. Stay tuned for those. And of course, I've also been speaking to people about liberty and freedom in all of its myriad forms. And today's episode is one such conversation with a wonderful couple by the names of Matt and Terry Kibbe. Matt and Terry are the founders of Free the People, which is an educational foundation charged with the mission of tuning in the next generation to the core values of personal liberty and peaceful cooperation. Now, I met them both in Lisbon, where they were speaking at LibertyCon. And were it not for both of our incredibly strict schedules over that weekend... I would have happily spoken to them for much longer since they have such a wealth of experience in the worlds of both legacy media and new media. In our conversation, we mainly discuss the current media landscape and what might be the best tools and strategies for communicating our message to the hearts and minds of people in today's highly volatile and changeable world. The marketplace of ideas has never been more universally accessible than it is at this particular time in history, and Terry and Matt are most certainly amongst those at the sharp end of the wedge when it comes to communicating ideas of liberty and freedom. I hope you enjoy our discussion. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us on your podcasting app. And you can always send feedback via the usual social media channels. But in the meantime, however, just sit back, relax and enjoy my conversation with Matt and Terry Kibbe. <laughs> well, we I, I think we we have quite a lot in common. I I come from the legacy media as well. I think you you and you sort of have your fair share of of that in the past, don't you? So I think what I'd like to talk about is um, you know the media and and spreading the message, and which I think is relevant to all of us. Um, myself personally i've come right through from the analog world i'm i'm sh- without guessing your ages i'm going to i'm going to say you've come the same way is that right yeah, you remember yeah. Yeah. you remember the good old days when we remember eight tracks <laughs> right <laughs> well i remember pre everything um i was a photojournalist in the beginning so and i was shooting on film and rushing back to an office and developing yeah. and all this kind of stuff but it's quite astonishing for us all to think about how how different it is now. Um, maybe if we could start, let's talk about what um, your experience is. Your experience is maybe in the the sort of transition that we've come through, and then obviously we can move into sort of how the best way to approach spreading good ideas is currently. Well, so. I was once introduced as someone with a checkered past, which I thought was really interesting. And it was um, describing my non-linear career path. I started out as an engineer um, and then moved into the public policy world. I worked at the Cato Institute, um, Competitive Enterprise Institute, and and other organizations like that. And then Matt and I started Free the People six years ago now. 
um, time flies. And, and we did it and we moved into video storytelling because we recognized that I mean, white papers are important um, for the seven people that read them. And so we just looked at video and social media as the way to reach so many more people at a much more cost-effective way. Yeah. And I was, um, I, I started off wanting to be an academic. I was in graduate school at George Mason University. And it's kind of um, comical to go back and read the journal articles that you would write as a, as a wannabe academic because, you know, all the big words. And, and, and that was just the title. And you know, <laughs> the, the title alone covered the first page and, and you'd have all these footnotes. And, and these were very important articles that had a potential audience of maybe a dozen people. And somewhere along the way, I wrote my first Wall Street Journal editorial, 800 words, and I just did the math. Like I could reach 12 people with an article that I would spend three months writing, or I could uh, reach that audience at the Wall Street Journal. And it, it just, I went from w wanting to be an academic to wanting to be a communicator that could translate substantial ideas in a way that, that people would understand. And, and Free the People is the culmination of that. But, but you and I have done lots of, of legacy media stuff, and, and I'm old enough to remember when Walter Cronkite would tell me every evening in 20-minute allocated segments, that's the way it is. You remember this. Young people don't realize that they couldn't Google it. They couldn't, um, they couldn't question the master because he got the last word on everything. And, and some sort of media industrial complex decided what we would know about and what we didn't get to know. And so it made information very difficult, very scarce, very sticky. And fast forward to technology and the internet. And I, I still, even though we could go deep into all the reasons why we should be skeptical of, of, of uh, the new censorship, but this, this really does level, level the playing field. We have an opportunity now to talk to almost everybody, and at least everybody that's curious enough to want to understand how the world works. And it might, it might be engineering. It might be um, epidemiology now. We've all become amateur epidemiologists. It might be economics. It might be philosophy. Whatever it is, you can, you can self-curriculate. It's, is that a word? It's not a word, but I, <laughs> I like it. I can't, I can't think of a better way to say that. And to me, that's like radically democratic, right? You, you, you no longer are dependent on elites to tell you what you're allowed to think. Yeah. And we should always be optimistic about that. And, and I think in a lot of ways, the, the, the insane um, censorship and, and this whole uh, apparatus that's designed to keep us from speaking our minds is a reaction to the fact that we're winning the conversation just by being free to think for ourselves. What, what I'm interested in, <clears throat> and I've been thinking a fair bit about recently, is the ideas of liberty and freedom um, seem to be having a resurgence. They seem to be. It's hard to say for sure because we sometimes we live in a bit of a bubble. Um, what I'm wondering is... I mean, all of what you've just spoken about is a result of the internet, let's be honest. The internet has caused this moment in time. It's very easy to look back now as well. I think I've got a lot more clarity looking back and seeing, oh my God, it was the internet. It really was. Everyone was saying it at the time, but now you can see, blimey, it's, it's destroying everything. It's destroying all the legacy institutions. It's destroying everything. So what I want to know is, does that mean that ideas of liberty have never had a place to come out and now they are coming out you know they were they were gate kept before right like you say we've, we're now in this place where there's free information rushing around do you think are you do you think now is the time and do you think now there's going to be a lot of people going hearing these ideas for the first time yeah and realizing you know this is this is this makes total sense to me yeah, I, I do. Um, and I think you're right when you said that our ideas were censored, for lack of a, a lack of a better word, because, you know, there's there's the media industrial complex, there's the defense industri industrial complex, the COVID industrial complex, and they all strive or thrive on bigger government and bigger spending. And so our message didn't re resonate with them. And it was against what their business model would, would help them with. I just saw an article this morning where CNN was announcing a new show with um, Magic Johnson and some woman, I don't even remember her name, her last name was King or Queen, 
But it said in this article that CNN's viewership in March dropped 61%. And they're hoping that this show, which is going to be about politics, but not political, was how they phrased it, is going to somehow bring all of these viewers back. But a 61% drop in just one month. Okay, I'm going to dork out because I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, um, also big academia talk about the ultimate gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. And, and there's this famous story that I, I believe is true where um, Sir John Templeton, who's, who ended up starting the IEA, the, the first think tank in London, went to Frederick Hayek and said, I'm going to run for office because I want to change the world. And, and Hayek said, no, 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 don't do that. This, we, need, we need to engage in this, in this battle of ideas. And, and he um, wrote this great piece that everyone should read, The, the Intellectuals and in Socialism, where he's, he's worrying about the secondhand dealers and ideas, uh, so-called intellectuals. And I, I think the article's funny because it's, it's kind of like me. Like I'm an I'm a, um, intellectual in a way that Hayek would say so, which was not a compliment. It was like you, you don't know enough to, and you're spouting off on all this stuff. But that whole um, idea controlling the narrative that what was allowed to get oxygen, that whole thing has collapsed. And again, because of technology and, and also the, the unsustainability of, of, of higher education and, and the cartel that it is. So I, I think, yes, we should be thinking expansively and radically and, and optimistically about what we can do with these new tools but it also means that Hayek's advice to Sir John Templeton no longer really applies. Like this is not a, no longer a top-down thing where if you want to change the world, you should become an academic and 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 sort of take control of the the levers of of that that top of the intellectual food chain. Now you can go straight to people. And Terry mentioned CNN earlier, and I forget the exact number, but it is true that CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, or just NBC, the whole, the whole NBC uh, universe, is on the eve of the election in the United States, that entire population that consumes those three channels is still smaller than one episode of Joe Rogan. Hmm. That is an awesome thing because it means that they no longer get to gatekeep what we know. And, and you know, podcasters and and people that are willing to have open and honest conversations that aren't this confrontational shout match that you see on Fox and MSNBC, that, that is the future. And I think you can sort of quickly realize why young people flock to Rogan because he doesn't, he doesn't tell them what to think. He doesn't insult their intelligence. He just is a curious guy trying to figure out how stuff works. It, it's interesting as well. <clears throat> I think they not only gate kept the actual content, they gate kept the way you consumed it as well. Yeah. And that's, I, I find that the most radical thing about it. I mean, um, it, I never thought I'd sit and listen to people for four hours. I really didn't. It was not on my radar like five years ago. And I've said this to many people before. I've had some of the most pivotal moments of my life recently mowing the lawn with some earbuds in going oh my god you know that's incredible you know I'm going to change my life because of what this person just told me you know who's sitting in a room thousands of miles away like four years ago yeah you know and and that's even more important you know your your kind of classic headline sub like sub edited nonsense people get the option now to go straight like if you want to know about something you know 100% if you look hard enough you're going to find an expert talking for 2 hours about it mm-hmm. why wouldn't you and and thank god that the media underestimated the human being as well because you know is everyone's doing it i'm watching i'm even watching youtube with two people sitting there talking like transfixed on content that costs the price of a, a room and, and a few mics, if you if you do it well, you know. And, and by the way, this this is one of the many reasons why um, academia, the entire financial structure of it, is collapsing, because you can get an average professor and and pay some insane amount of money per year for the privilege of sitting in that classroom with that professor, or you can go online and find the best guy. Yeah, and it's free. It's usually free. And so this goes back to self-curriculating. Um, you can you can do that for yourself. You have to be motivated. You have to be curious. 
but why would you spend um, a couple hundred grand for a college education when you could, in fact, get the good things that come from from a classical liberal education without um, burdening yourself for the first twenty years of your of your work life? Hmm. Um, I want to talk about the tools that that we use because I had, you know, like most of us, I every t- every morning I get up and open the computer. AI has completely changed. You know, I, last week I thought I was on top of it all and I've got it doing some stuff and I'm going, this is great. And then this morning it's like, no, it's something you, you need to move on already, right? It's crazy. What do you think about writing in the future? What do you think about writing articles and stuff? I, I have not done any of these AI experiments. And as someone that... Um, I, I think uh, our team would quit if we even attempted to do anything. Yeah, it's funny AI. because our team is is half artists and half... So they're all creators, half of them write, half of them create, and they're, they're all freaked out about AI, particularly the, my, my artist, um, because he's afraid that he'll be replaced by that. And I don't think that's true, because I think, as I understand AI, and I'm not this uh, apocalyptic guy that thinks that, that we're all going to be in the matrix in 15 years when the robots take over, um, it's all AI is ultimately is is an average of things that have been done and the the spark of human creativity is about some sort of creative new thing that happens and that could be in 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 visual art it it could be in written art and i i don't think that you can replace that with a machine so we're gonna we're gonna learn with all of these new technologies. We were just talking about how the internet so so radically transformed the world in a positive way. I I'm not convinced that AI is somehow so fundamentally different that suddenly technology is a bad thing. I don't think that's true. So I think that there is a, a place um, that AI will p- possibly take over, which is kind of like the middle market mass consumer. Um, Hallmark movies, there's a very specific script for a Hallmark movie, right? Like an overworked female executive goes to Vermont for a weekend and meets the innkeeper and he convinces her to stay. And he's totally ripped. And he's totally ripped. I mean, so I could like, AI could write that. Um, AI could produce... AI could write that better, actually. Right. (laughs) And, And they could produce like all of the horrible artwork that we see in hotels, right? So, I mean, I... Better. Better. Yeah. so I do think that there's a there will be a place for it, but there's always going to be human creativity that AI can't can't surpass. I had or these um, these comic book artists, and and one of our one of the guys on our team, our creative director Matt Pataglia, is also an accomplished comic book artist, and um, they were all sort of in this despondent state that that they were going to be replaced. By robots, but they also were, I believe, the first comic book company, and I can't remember the name of the company now. Um, they actually punched a script into AI and had it do the artwork for a comic, and it it worked for that. It's very disconcerting. It's it, it only works if you like freaky dystopian things because it doesn't really get the human experience very well. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So if you want if you want to do something super creepy, yeah, maybe. Maybe robots can do that for you. But again, like if you want to create something really beautiful and profound and, and something that no one had ever exactly thought about before, I think I think you need a person to do that. Yeah, I mean, like what you just said about they take the average of everything that's happened before, um, I thought was a great way to put it, but it's never going to... I don't think it can innovate. Um, it's a bit like... Um, I mean, I'm thinking at it as well from a sort of business perspective you know you're still going to be able to make money say or in your, in your business but at the same roughly the same thing happened in the print industry the middle of the bell curve has been decimated but now if you're a, if you want to buy a specialist magazine you can buy these one of a hundred mags for like 30 bucks you know every and people buy them religiously so um you maybe maybe that's true i i was just thinking i was thinking of it in terms of the bell curve i couldn't help thinking you know the the top end of the bell curve will remain human i mean my original question i was actually i actually meant do you think there's going to be any merit in written stuff in general i don't even mean whether oh i see because that's that's what i'm coming to terms with now in 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 my work is 
written stuff is getting superseded because AI can translate everything, can turn, you know, can turn something into speech, can, you know, can do all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, and search is not going to be something you type necessarily. I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm making, it, I'm making it up as I go along like everyone else. But if I look back through my own process, so I was like you guys, I was a, I'm a storyteller, but it took me a while to understand that. And in the beginning, I was a photographer, photojournalist. I'm t really obviously telling stories. And then because of the nature of the media, I moved into film because my camera suddenly started shooting film. And it was like, wow. And then I realized, wow, this is a much better medium for telling stories. Mm -hmm. you know, it's much better. Yeah. You know, one photo, and I'm not one of those people that believes you can take a photo that just is so majestic that it's, you know, no, it's nonsense five minutes on camera and I can get more information than the best photo that's ever been created. And then we get to long form conversation from there. Now I don't care about film even. I, I look at film and I think, okay, we're going to sit here for 45 minutes. I could do a film and then I'm going to be editing it for God knows how long. And then it's going to go back and forwards and this and that. How many people am I reaching? And how many people now with AI I'll give you an example. I interviewed someone yesterday who is turning all of their spoken word into foreign languages and AI avatars are saying it. You know, yeah. imagine the power of that. This conversation, even small little conversation, suddenly five, ten languages yeah. with avatars at the touch of a button. That's well, you incredible. know, we, um, it's funny because I, I would always have considered myself a decent writer and that was my, that was my evolution is to trying to take complex ideas and make them simple and accessible stories for people to consume. And, um, but when we started free the people, we didn't know what our medium was going to be. We just said, we want to reach young people outside of our bubble. We called them the Liberty curious generation. And within six months, I think we essentially became a video production company. Because that that storytelling and, and and the simple fact is that this is how young people consume information. Now we've gone from sh very short um, stories because because Facebook lied to us and they told us that young people had short attention spans when in fact um, Facebook manipulated your attention span and and a lot of young people fled Facebook because they hated that manipulated experience and they started going to to podcasts and and YouTube and, and binging on Netflix, wherever they went. And again, if, if it's content that was, that was good and spoke to them and was curated by them and not imposed by some algorithm, they'll watch, they'll watch Lex Friedman for six hours. Like who does that? But if you choose to do that, it makes a lot of sense and it's, it's how to learn. So we've, we've, we continue to evolve in our business model from at first it was short, quippy content and then evolved into long form documentaries or just stories about people um, either e either accomplishing beautiful things or, or being prevented from accomplishing beautiful things by being oppressed because, because government is stopping them from do that. Um, and now we've evolved into, we're doing our first comedy projects and we're, we're going to start to do more narrative filmmaking because um, even we think the market is probably saturated with documentary content and we need to, we need to experiment to see what turns people on. But, but we've also gone full circle and we hired um, a young guy who actually understands TikTok. And so he's now tasked with taking all of these hundreds of hours of video content that we've made and cutting them into small slices and bits for TikTok with the hope that eventually they'll find their way to the longer form and, and, and learn something deeper. But I mean, I, that's interesting because I've, I've, I reckon you're, you, you're think, similarly thinking with me. Have you stopped the long form documentary completely? Because it's super expensive, isn't it? When you compare it to a long form, like a Lex Friedman podcast, still long. Yeah. But look at the overheads on something like that. It's like pr practically nothing. Really. Yeah. Uh, we haven't abandoned it. And um, I, I think... Part of, part of our business model that I think is innovative is like, it's not that expensive for us. So our team is all um, in-house and, and we keep them very busy and they're, they're very well paid and they're very talented, but we produce a tremendous amount of stuff. And I think, I think hiring a third party to do documentary stuff can be wildly expensive. Um, so we, I think we've, we've, we've tackled the economics of that so that 
And we also don't like, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you're spending a year to sort of do pre-production for a documentary, mm-hmm. um, we, we, we go, we go the whole process in a couple of weeks and, yeah. and we do the shoot and, and the editing obviously takes more than a couple of weeks, but that's um, what I mean though. Yeah. That's the bane of my life, editing. Yeah. I mean, I, if I can't, the last film I made, I ins- insisted we had a five day edit at the end of it. And I said, I'll deliver at the end of that five days. And then I'm walking away. If you want to jig it after that, it's up to you. You can take, you, know, you can take it. But uh, I can't stand yeah. the editing process anymore. I absolutely despise I, I it. I mean, our team, like most people, will take as long to edit as we give them. So we've learned to have very strong deadlines and it, and it works. But, you know, he said that all of our, you know, our staff is on already on our payroll. So it's all sunk cost. And the very first documentary that we did five years ago that is still paying dividends today um, was a documentary about Thomas Massey. It's called Off the Grid with Thomas Massey. He's a Republican congressman and he lives the most environmentally sound life that any hardcore environmentalist would want. I mean, completely off the grid, um, solar power water from a well he dug he built his house by hand literally he and his sons and it's this beautiful timber home and somebody asked us well how much did that cost and our response was four tanks of gas and a couple cases of beer and we shot it over the weekend and we stayed at thomas's house i mean obviously there's the the well, we human were, capital these, these, but we were paying these people so right it's it's a it's a little bit of a joke because they they were on payroll but um, and, and that, that, um, documentary was just featured randomly, unexpectedly in this huge New York times feature piece. It was like three or four weeks ago, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and, and it shed this, and this, this Congressman is a very libertarian. He's, he's, he's a registered Republican because libertarians don't win office in the States, but, but he's basically a libertarian who's got this folksy redneck a homespun way of explaining, you know, self-reliance and, 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 and stewardship to the land and all of these, these, these obviously libertarian values. Um, and inexplicably because the story was compelling, um, and because the Congressman refused to talk to the New York times thinking they're just going to write a nasty hit piece about him. They, they wrote a very positive, empathetic piece about him. I mean, they're, their hardcore viewers were kind of pissed off about it because why are you saying nice things about this guy? So I have this, I've, I think uh, this may be a made up word, but there's another one. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> earned media where you go on somebody else's show or you go on MSNBC and get shouted at or whatever that is. There's paid media where you just run ads to, to, to tell your story the way you want. And then there's creative, created media, which, which is this, this narrative storytelling that we've been talking about that, is if it's authentic and well done, it changes everything in a way that, that allows you to tell your story the way you wanted to tell it, not the way that someone else is going to manipulate it by you know, cutting and pasting and asking hostile questions and all the things that happens in, in old media. So that, and, and that, that was, in, that we've always argued that that was happening and then the New York Times proved it, which was kind of cool. So what are you what are you aiming at now then when you when you produce a bit of content obviously it's eyeballs you're after or ears or whatever so you know what are your kind of what's on the top of your list now when you think right this is where we want this to be placed or this is where we want it to be seen you know well i mean to be honest with you because things are changing so quickly we're struggling with that um you know we had relied on on youtube and and facebook and that's you know, even YouTube is, is, is a little bit of a bigger struggle than it has been. So we are working on that. Like we are working and placing our, our documentaries in film festivals to try to reach different audiences that way and to try to pick up a distribution deal, even as a nonprofit. Um, but it's, it's a question that keeps, well, it keeps me up at night. Like, where do we put this out there? How do we get the eyeballs or the, the rules keep changing. And I think, um, you know, we, we don't, um, we hate clickbait with a burning passion. Um, we want, we want to reach audiences who won't, aren't necessarily already coming to our church or belonging to our tribe. We want to reach new audiences and the very nature of social media makes that a more difficult project in the first place. On top of that, there is absolutely, um, soft censorship happening 
for our type of content. And we're not, we're not like right wing angry. We're not the types of people you would expect to be targeted by social media, but, um, they still make it quite difficult. And I also think, um, you know, five years ago, my, my public Facebook page had like a million and a half people on it. And it was a great place to distribute our content and we would get millions and millions of views. And now I can't get three likes from a million people. And I'm like, okay, so they want me to pay again to talk to my same community. So that that's essentially worthless. Facebook is worthless in terms of reaching, reaching audience. Um, but we keep, uh, endlessly experimenting with new platforms. And I'm, I'm curious to see what, what Twitter becomes because Elon Musk clearly has some ambitions to, to compete with, with YouTube and other places as well. And, and he's not perfect, but he seems to be more committed to an open platform that allows you to talk to people. And it, it, they're obviously not there yet. It's pretty, it's pretty not functional right now, but that's fine. Like it, it was pretty screwed up place. Yeah. It's been fun watching Eli actually morph into yeah. the person he is. You, if you, if you have any sort of libertarian leanings, you've noticed a change in the guy, haven't you? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden he's been sort of knocking up against sort of government overreach so many times. It's like something like the penny dropped. And now it's like, he's on a mission, which I find really exciting. I mean, I, mean, I agree with you at the moment. I spend, that's really, I mean, I've always been interested in Twitter anyway. Um, because it's a great place to get news, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree. Yeah, he'll want to do something with that now. He's got the free to reach platform, supposedly. So he'll want to do something with it. And yeah, I mean, um, what what are your favorite um, productions that you've made so far? The ones that, that you hold dearest to your heart? And what were they about? Um, well, so my favorite documentary is one that we um, are releasing this year called... The Free Life, Portrait of an Artist. And it's a story about this amazing artist from Cuba who, when he was 13 years old, his grandmother said, if you want to be a true artist, you're going to have to leave your country. And he made his way through Mexico and and has been living in Miami. And it's incredibly successful. And his art is beautiful. And he has these great, very anti-Castro pieces as well. And his story is just um, absolutely incredible. And I'm very proud of that. And I think even... I was talking with someone and and his response was, well, hasn't, you know, the Cuba story been done too much? And I said no and pointed to last year's um, riots and demonstrations in Cuba where they had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people um, protesting in the streets for freedom based on, uh, you know, Twell's uh, song. And and so I think it's it's a good reminder for for people. And, And Cuba's in the news. They still have a because of those demonstrations, there was a thousand people arrested, and people are in serving prison sentences of like twenty five years. Cuba came up on my on my feed this morning. Yeah. People were driving boats over and mm-hmm. dropping stuff off and meeting yeah. in the middle of the ocean and stuff. I just randomly, I was like, oh, I, I didn't, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know about that yeah. stuff, yeah. but it, it did. You know, I know what you mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was um, one of one of the stories that we like, um, and this this goes back to a project we did in Serbia. I don't know, maybe four years ago now, um, we discovered a pattern when we're telling stories about, about the abuses of authoritarianism. And, and you learn that authoritarians almost always target artists and actors and poets and, and the creative class first because they, they are, or at least were, the, the creative thinkers, the dissidents, the ones that were willing to speak uh, truth to power and, and we, we, we documented this um, in, in a, a thing about uh, Tito and Yugoslavia. But as you see this, you, you see that, you know, Castro banned the Beatles and, and the Soviet Union had a, a blacklist of, of rock and roll bands that you couldn't listen to, which were all my favorite bands. And it was kind of ridiculous. Like, I think um, Van Halen was... Oh, we have the whole list. I don't know. I have the whole list, but it was ridiculous. Like the village people were fascists and, and it's like, <laughs> They banned on. Julio Iglesias too. Yeah, Julio something. Iglesias no, no, was banned. Matter, and, matter, matter. and it, it kind of goes back to the, the, the Velvet Revolution, which was literally started by an underground band. Um, the Plastic People of the Universe, inspired by Frank Zappa and, you know, go full circle to Vaclav Havel, um, uh, was, took a lot of his inspiration from Zappa. So there's, 
there's this artistic integrity that again is a very libertarian idea um, that I think is a great way to reach young people or for who for whatever reason uh, have been convinced that this democratic socialism is a really cool thing and I won't have to work and I can be my creative self and it's like no the first people that go to the gulags are the creators well and we just started watching that series intercontinental I forget it's it's based on a true story um, from World War II about a woman in France and she sp- spent a year and smuggled 2,000 writers and artists um, out of out of France when it was you know, uh, occupied by the Nazis. And so the persecution of artists goes back. But it's a different way instead of just thinking about, um, you know, we always make the economic argument as to why socialism fails. Um, but we can make the cultural argument as to why socialism is, is a noxious, intolerant ideology that um, is the opposite of what um, the cool kids will tell you. Or better yet, tell the positive story of people, the entrepreneurs and, and the successful people that succeed in spite of in spite of government. We did a documentary, just a short documentary about this crazy brewer named Vladimir in Belgrade, Serbia. And we actually connected him with a brewer in the United States, Jim Caruso of Flying Dog, and they did a collaboration of beer. And Matt, because he always has to, you know, t- quote dead economists, he got a Bastiat quote in there, but you know, they used to say when goods cross borders, troops don't. And so you have this brewer in Serbia doing collaborations of, of beer with people from all of these countries around Serbia that they used to fight with. And he talks about, um, you know, going around walls. And he says, well, sometimes I go over them. Sometimes I go through them. Sometimes under, but I always get on the other side. And it's, it's just such a great positive positive way of looking at things. Yeah, so there's a there's a new entrepreneurial mindset in these these former Soviet satellite countries where if, if you went right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you would discover that they still had that inability to problem solve because they were never allowed to solve problems. And and the new generations are are going to run circles around the United States if if the United States isn't careful because there is that sense that I, I I'm free to create I'm free to accomplish things, and I'm going to do that. And and that um, that that part of our story, the the uplifting, beautiful things that happen when people are free to cooperate, that's that's what we aspire to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's I, we're better we the, the the royal we all libertarians we're we're pretty good at talking about how badly government sucks, mm-hmm. um, but we're not as good about this this beautiful thing. Um, the, the, the communities that are created and, and the, 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 the unbelievable solutions that no one thought was possible. Um, and it's not just about the Elon Musks of the world. It's about everybody doing, doing that, just that process of figuring out the world and, and dealing with uncertainty and dealing with, with problems that come up that you didn't expect. Um, decentralized solutions create beautiful things. And, and I think we have to spend more time putting a, a face and, and allowing people to get emotionally attached to that brewer that's making unbelievably awesome beer in a place you'd never expect to find mm. it. It's the, <clears throat> the, I mean, that's a, the perfect pitch for libertarian f- f- media, as far as I'm concerned. I've, we have this conversation all the time. Uh, the, the, the best PR is to notice what pockets of freedom have given rise to find a person tell their story it's like so obviously good yeah uh, and yeah it's what it's what we're doing we have a, a free cities you know we we do exactly the same thing go to the places where free cities exist mm-hmm. find what pe- what's what's different who's doing what why is why is it how is it affected in a good way um rather than yeah like you say slagging everyone off all the time which mm-hmm. Is he? I mean, I don't. We can do it in private, I think. Yeah. But it doesn't gain any friends out in the in the in the real world. I don't think right. it's the you know, and also I think it's one of the bad. I think it's one of the PR problems with libertarianism in general. It's always against something. Yeah. Rather than I'm for freedom, and you know the ways that you can show that is, is very easy if you have any storytelling experience. Um, going back to something you said, well, 
what's up with democratic socialism? How, how the what they're doing really well. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got some great characters. I'd I'd put them as the number one sort of, you know, opposition to Threat. to what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. We've we've done a lot of thinking about um, uh, trying to be empathetic when you when you listen to um, our young democratic socialist rock star Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and um, she says a lot of things that objectively are sort of patently ridiculous. Like, um, I've, my generation has never known real prosperity. And she of course grew up in the richest County, in the richest state, in the richest country at the richest time in the entire history of humanity. (laughs) So she's, she's not, she's not right about that, (laughs) but she's, she, she talks about something that I think, um, it's, it's almost Jordan Peterson esque in the sense that she talks a lot about dignity. And, and I think a lot of young people are struggling to, to find purpose. And, and, they, in, in, and in some ways, we're victims of our own success where, you know, if you don't get the new iPad, you're, you're devastated and you're, and you're, and you're a victim and, and it's not fair. Um, but the fact that, that we don't worry about the things that we used to worry about in the United States. We used to worry 100 years ago, am I going to be able to feed my kids this winter? Are we going to have enough food? Am I going to, to be able to, to put a roof over their head? Just basic, basic, basic questions of survival, which, which amongst many other things gives you purpose. Like I got to go out and work my ass off just to accomplish these goals. And, and now we, we are struggling with meaning because, you know, we've solved all of those problems and, and prosperity and, and this beautiful distributed network of people that, that, keep us uh, fed and and clothed that that's a thing that was created by freedom but where do you get meaning in life and i i think again we have a better answer to that question i think i think there's there's um there's dignity in work in controlling your own destiny in uh, trying to accomplish things and failing and and the only the only thing i'd say about jordan peterson is he's a very dark outlook and i don't think it has to be dark at all i think it's beautiful when people are free to, to struggle. And if you've never failed, you've probably never felt good about yourself either because you never tried that hard. I mean, I'm going to go back to my um, favorite AOC quote. I was going to do air quotes, but realizing it's not video, that would not have made any difference, um, where she said, it's better to be morally right than to be factually correct. Mm-hmm. And that's why they win, because they talk about, they do stories, and it's moral, and it's empathy. And our side talks about facts and figures, and so we will never... You will never change someone's mind with, with that. It, it always just goes back to storytelling. But I was also thinking about um, Bernie Sanders when he was you know, running for president. And all of the things that he was railing against, we all agreed with, right? Endless war, the war on drugs. You go down the list and it was like, oh, I agree with Bernie. But we don't agree with his solutions. And so our solution is always freedom and their solution is always more government. So how do, how do, you, how do you communicate that? How do you communicate that best? The, I mean, what's our what's our what's our hook? If they've got dignity or they've got, I mean, yeah, what, what's our? Well, we shouldn't like um, one of the things we shouldn't do is give up the good words. Like dignity should be our word, sure, and community should be our word, and and even I know some libertarians um, get all bent out of shape about the word democratic because they're thinking about vulgar democracy where 51% of the people get to do whatever they want to 49%. But to me, democratic is, is a far more expansive concept where, where power is shifted back to the end user. So we should use words like democratic and, and, and not socialism, but the, but the word social, um, we sometimes sound like we're antisocial and, and (laughs) the, the, the whole reason that, Freedom is so powerful is not because of what you might do, but what you might do with other people in voluntary cooperation. So I think, I think the language we use is, is really important. And, and in the States, at least, um, you know, they talk, uh, the democratic socialists talk about social justice. And we, we know that that's, that's, that's kind of a perversion of the concept of, of justice. But as a result, we're giving up that word too. And I think, and, and, and by the way, these are very value-laden words and they have 
they they carry moral weight when people use them or abuse them. So I think I think part of it is is you developing a a value based way of connecting with people at an emotional level. Um, and I think a personal story always does that better, and as opposed to an abstract thing. But I also think that we should come to terms with the fact that I'm an economist. I process the world through supply and demand, and I'm a freak. That's not normal. And that's not how humans think about the world. They process the world through their emotions, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's also just the way it is. So let's let's get comfortable as passionately as we we are behind closed doors about about um, lifting people up and and problem solving. That sh- that should be reflected in our work. But when you go like we're at this conference and. And sometimes you go to these conferences uh, with very passionate people that have this this massive spreadsheet up there to show us the math on why too much government involvement in healthcare can can lead to rationing and, and people not getting the care they need. And if AOC was up there, she'd tell this story about a mom mm-hmm. who couldn't get help for her child. So that was just a really long way of saying that you just have to make it personal and, and tell a story. Mm. And that's how you reach people are you getting uh, uh, like take this um uh, liberty con a lot of youngsters here um how are you how do you feel about if you've been mixing watching observing how do you feel about young people and this movement are they getting it apart from the guy that showed all the graphs and stuff um it i think it depends on what country they're from um we've found such a bigger passion from kids that are coming from former Soviet countries, Serbia, um, that kind of thing, versus the students that are coming here from France. We should just write France off the, just give up on them. Um, but we do, we find a bigger passion here in Europe um, than we do when we're speaking to groups in, in the United States because it's not so bad there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have a very good friend, Pedar, from from Belgrade, and he drove us um, past Block 37, which was the apartment complex that he grew up in. And it was a cinder block, massive, horrible structure that sucked the life out of me just driving mm-hmm. past. And so these, you know, these people actually have firsthand understanding and knowledge of what big government can do to you. And they had this incredible thirst for freedom. Mm-hmm. I think um, I would. One of the reasons we come here and we speak is it's incredibly uplifting to 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 meet so many young people that are interested in this stuff. And and both the, you know, I was picking on the guy with the with the spreadsheet. That was you one day. Yeah, I, I'm sure I did that <laughs> once. But that's not that's not really what you're discovering. Like I I got into these ideas because I was one of those dorky kids that read the right books, and again there was like a couple dozen of us that did that. But that's not this community. Like some of those guys are here, um, but you have tremendous diversity. And by the way, there's almost as many women as there are as men, which is a clear sign of a vibrant social movement but they're they're not all like want to be academics they they have this entire distributed skill set that's that's going to do all these things that we're talking about which is which is why we come and our our talk in a couple minutes will be ultimately the importance of of telling a story and and reaching new audiences with with empathy and and to think wildly expansively about about our potential because their biggest challenge is that their audience is way too big. Like, what are you going to do with all these potential customers? And and our problem was, can I get on MSNBC where they're going to shout at me? Um, and that's that's a closed system. This is an open system, and and we can. We I just want them to think radically expansively and optimistically about what they can accomplish. I agree with you. <clears throat> you know, going back a few minutes when you were talking about Jordan Peterson and, and purpose, and I think if you can inspire the purpose, and obviously the, for me the purpose is freedom, uh, that's a really powerful one. You know, everyone loves their purpose. People that haven't got it crave it. People who've got it, it gets them up in the morning. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson's right on that one. Meaning is, yeah. you know, super important. And I think, um, yeah, freedom's the meaning for me. Anyway, uh, you are speaking in a few minutes and I can see my time's up, but I've got one last question for you. It's a traditional question we ask everyone on this podcast. 
um, you have a one-year sabbatical paid for. So you've got a patron who's giving you money to do whatever you want for a year. What are you going to do? If Well, since we're going to make this up, um, I am going to make the the movie that I've always wanted to make. Which is? I don't know. I don't have the budget. Oh, I no, you've got gonna, the budget now. You've got I the budget. I thought you were going to say you're going to just drop everything and go to every single remaining Grateful Dead show. Yeah. <laughs> which is what he would you actually do. You could do them both. Do. What's the this, film? What's this, the... this year is the last uh, tour of, of my beloved Grateful Dead. But um, I, probably what I would do is just because we've been um, short on time is we, we are writing a book together. And it's, it's based on a series of talks that we've started giving together over the last four or five years that again is just based on storytelling and um, I am a very different speaker when I'm speaking with my wife because she doesn't let me get away with certain quoting um, dead economists all the time certain things that I would do otherwise <laughs> making up words and yeah. all that stuff yeah so so you would take a year and, and and write a book can we do that in some like really amazing exotic locations yeah it's all paid <laughs> you've got a year it's paid yeah. for <gasps> what are you gonna do I'm gonna travel I'm travel. gonna see all the places that I haven't been able to see all right. Fair enough. I look forward to your book and I look forward to seeing you in Thailand or wherever it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> where we will be writing the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, Matt and Terry, thanks. It's been fab talking to you. Too short. Hopefully we'll run into each other another time, but um, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.